just a little bit. We have one or two folks in the audience tonight that we feel may be interested in a pretty particular case. So we're going to move right on to agenda item number seven and agenda item number eight tonight. And they are actually grouped together on our handout. Also, I stated that I would allow 10 minutes per side of the issue, and I'm going to extend that on this case uh, for at least 15 minutes. So just so you know that there will be extension on this case uh, as far as the in favor of and the against. We will allow 15 minutes per side on this agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're going to be reducing this uh, from both cases. Agenda um, item number seven. I think I'll see those. Mr. Carpenter, if you'll take note of that, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gladden. Uh, Matt, we'll go ahead. Since this is the City of Alta case, I'd like to ask you this time to present cases number seven and eight, BA 2017 03, Georgia Park, and 2017 04. Uh, both Georgia Park LLC. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is two separate requests by the same applicant for the same property. Um, just like we talked about at the work session, I think it would be a good idea to have discussion for this as one project in one group of requests. But please note that they are separate items. So when it comes time to actually vote on them, we'll need to make separate motions. One, the first one being the resigning request, which needs to go first. The other one is planned development request. Um, in terms of public hearing, um, it's at your discretion if you want to hold public input separately um, or hold it together and then perhaps ask for further comment. My recommendation to you is if the resigning request recommendation is for denial, that may cut short the discussion for the planned development request uh, because it hinges on the request of zoning change. Um, if, however, you recommend approval of some zoning change in the first request, um, then it might be good to entertain further discussion on the plan development depending on the type of zoning change that is being recommended. So with that, subject property consists of 4.43 acres and is located at 601 to 603 Georgia Avenue. As you see on the map on the screen, which is also in your packet, this is along the west side of Georgia Avenue, immediately west of the intersection of Georgia and West Park Avenue and running northward toward Cary Street. Um, the subject property is zoned R15 completely. Um, they are requesting a split zoning of RM um, and R10 um, for front of the property versus rear. Um, as you see on the zoning map, everything around here is zoned R15. Future development map of the comprehensive plan um, gives us character area designations. And you see this is all yellow. That stands for established residential on the character area chart. Um, and as a reminder, the established residential character area makes allowable all forms of residential zone, whether it be the most um, restrictive, which would be RE, uh, all the way up through RM, which is multi county residential. Aerial, um, this is from a few years ago, which shows the subject property outlined in yellow. You see the housing pattern and the single family homes around it. You see the subject property, which has two existing single family homes. There are, however, three parcels. There's a house on the lot to the south, a vacant lot in the middle, and then a larger lot to the north, which also has a single family residence. Uh, boundary survey shows three parcels, respectively, but it all totals to the 4.43 acres. It also shows the proposed zoning line running north-south through the property to where R10 would be about 135 feet deep um, on portions of property facing Georgia Avenue. The rear yard area would be our end zone. Applicants are proposing to combine these lots together and then, then redevelop the property under a planned development proposal, which is the second agenda <coughs> item, um, where they would have individual homes on the front and then the multifamily complex in the back. It would be six homes facing Georgia Avenue. Um, all but one of those lots meet in the R10 standard. Um, the lot that's farthest to the south, which is on this map labeled as S1, um, is 75 feet wide instead of minimum required 80. The rear yard you see would be multifamily complex consisting of 36 dwelling units um, in three-story buildings. Um, of course, there's a lot of information in your packet regarding the details. But just to refresh your memory on the master layout plan, you see the arrangement of lots. Um, there would be two access drives off of George Avenue. Each would be two-way um, to connect to a loop 
parking lot system around the apartments. And then the homes themselves would have rear yard, detached carports, or maybe garages um, that would also access this internal network of driveway. These would be private drives, not public streets. Um, one of the benefits of this design is that each home does not have its own driveway up George Avenue. They are simply consolidated um, into the rest of the project. A lot of open space, a lot of landscaping. Uh, the applicants have gone to great lengths to try and maintain as much <coughs> existing vegetation as possible, particularly around the perimeters. Um, they would have a fence or bordering around the multifamily complex, uh, plenty of open space. Um, in your packet, of course, there's a lot of information about it, but as you recall from plan developments, we give you a list of deviations, which is the parts of the code that it does not meet the letter of the code, but certainly the intent. And this plan development only has two deviations which is actually quite a few less than what we normally see with plan development. So it almost meets code um, under conventional zoning authority in our tent. Um, going through the packet, one of these were handouts that you saw either at the work session or before. Um, this is schematics of proposed single family homes. We should have four plans. And then the apartment building. There's several building elevation drawings in the packet. Again, it's a three-story building. It has porches and then walkways that extend outward from the buildings. This is the front and rear elevation of the larger of the three buildings, the side elevations of that. And then the smaller buildings, there's two of these. Um, here's the front and rear elevations of that particular building. Um, they've also been given you some copies of photographs, which are representative of some facades. Um, this is exactly, I think, what they're proposing. It's a similar <coughs> design of construction that they've come across. So just to give you a better picture that's in color of an actual building rather than a black and white drawing. Um, signage, um, if you look on their master plan, they have two entrance signs, one for each entrance driveway. A monument sign, fairly modest in size, only 12 square feet. Um, the sign area would be six feet wide and two feet high, but mounted on a permanent base. Um, it's proposed to be lighted sign. You see this indication of the sign light fixtures at the bottom um, that would illuminate the sign. Subject properties currently, you have the existing home on the southern parcel, the vacant lot in between, um, and then part of the yard to, of the parcel to the north. And if you look at that aerial, it's a pretty good sized lot by itself. This is the south half of it, and the northern half of it has an existing residence. Um, Deeper into the property, I've walked all through the 2.84 acres. This is part of the rear yard area looking southeast toward one of the existing residents of the neighbors. Um, it's currently separated by a wooden fence. Um, this is looking north along the western property line. Um, again, this is all in the rear yard area. Streetscapes, um, this is the front of the property this is at the intersection of George Avenue and West Park um, looking northward. You see the red signs on the left, that is in the front of the subject property. So this is looking northward of George Avenue past the subject property. And the about face looking southward down George Avenue from that same point. And then looking east from that intersection down West Park Avenue back toward Oak Street. And our technology has faded away. <laughs> we don't want that quick enough. <laughs> Bear with us, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Sorry. back on, Mr. Chairman, I've taken several pictures of the surrounding homes. As you look at their master plan in your packet, it denotes um, the names and parcel numbers of the surrounding properties. You see this one of these things, county residences. Um, <coughs> in the interest of PowerPoint space, I did not include a photograph of each of them in here. It's, it's sort of a sampling of homes around the perimeter, just to give a feel for the neighborhood that's around the subject property. Um, also in your packet, just to touch on a few things, in my packet I'm referring to both packets, um, one for BA03 and the other one for BA04, but you have the staff report which has a lot of information in it, 
Um, on the plan development request, you have a letter of intent from the applicant, which describes in much greater detail uh, what they're proposing and what they're trying to achieve. We have all these graphics and drawings, which I just showed you. Uh, we also have several letters that we have received, letters or emails uh, from concerned citizens. Um, three of those you received today, uh, email from myself <coughs> earlier. I've left you hard copies of those as a set in your uh, meeting place this evening. Um, and I suspect since they've been coming in, there might be a few more left in my email box, which did not make it here in time for this meeting. Uh, we'll put them in the packet for City Council. The other thing I would like to draw your attention to is in your second packet for the plan development <coughs> request. If you look on page seven of that staff report, and you have the development review conference at the top, and then you have what I call potential conditions of approval. And that is if the zoning change were approved and the plan development proposal were to go forward. Matt, Matt can I interrupt? Do you, do you have any of the four of those packets of number eight? I have just the non graphics part of the packets of you seven and eight. I have one copy of each. Anybody have that one? We, none of us have that. Thing. None of us have number eight. They were not attached last week. We didn't have that. Those were emailed to you? We have a lot of copies of that. You know, my computer done that. All right, I'm missing both. I'm not missing both, I'm missing eight. That's just, yeah, just eight, I'm sorry. The contents of both packets are almost identical. The graphics are the same, the mapping is the same, um, the recommendation from staff is the same. Um, there's just that one change for the back of the staff report for the plan development request. Um, as we talked about in the work session, if you wish to consider the zoning change policy in the plan development then becomes prudent. Um, there needs to be conditions of approval on any plan development. This would be a bit right. um, Staff's recommendation for denial is based on several things. Could you read this, please? Absolutely. In short, the issue staff finds with the rezoning request is as you look at the zoning map in your packet, which was on the screen, mm -hmm. um, the entire area is zoned R15. And strictly from a zoning pattern perspective, you're introducing an RM zoning, which is several ladder steps ahead of the R15. In other words, far more dense. Um, R15 density for dwelling units is 2.9 units per acre. RM zoning allows up to 18 units per acre. There's quite a difference in the sharp contrast between those. Because there is no other zoning nearby, and by nearby I mean by at least 1,500 feet in any direction, um, anything but R15 zoning, we're introducing a new pattern of zoning into this neighborhood. Um, Staff finds neighborhood built out is single family residential, has been for decades, very stable, um, almost a pristine R15 type neighborhood. So with that sharp of a contrast, staff finds that change of density inappropriate for the area. So we're recommending denial of the zoning change. Um, R10 is only one step away from R15, and under certain circumstances, there may be justification for it. Um, but again, it's, it's a bit of contrast to what is there. And that is certainly much more agreeable staff than R10. Um, so with the plan development request that's before you, which has a total of 42 dwelling units, six of them single family, 36 in multifamily, and it is predicated on an approval of RM zoning for at least a portion of the property. Um, and because staff is recommending against the zoning change, we're also recommending against the zone, uh, plan development request. However, if a zoning change were to be approved and go forward, staff has given you on page seven, some potential conditions of approval, and I can read those to you, Mr. Chairman, if you want to get to that point. Please, sir, since we all don't have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll just read even the preamble. As stated on page two, staff is recommending denial of both the rezoning request and this plan development request. 
However, if the rezoning is approved, then the plan development should be approved with at least the following conditions of approval in the first step of Number one, approval shall be granted for mixed residential plan development in general accordance with the submitted master plan and building graphics that consist of single, <coughs> single family detached dwellings each on their own lot and no more than 36 multifamily dwellings grouped on their own parcel. All other allowable uses in RM and R10 zoning shall be excluded except for home occupations that generate no traffic. And as a footnote there, and uh, refer you back to our discussion at the work session, RM zoning allows up to 18 millions per acre. If you do the math of the 2.4 acres to be rezoned to RM, divide through by the 36, you get a lot less than that, in mean, order of about 12 billion units per acre. That is what the applicant is proposing. But if RM zoning is approved, that property could be developed conventionally, i.e. without planned development, at 18 units per acre. The staff's recommendation is if you were to recommend approval of RM zoning for that 2.4 acres, that you consider recommending with that a density cap of 12 or maybe 13 units per acre. That would be one recommendation. So this condition number one would go with that. It would put a density cap, or i.e. a total number of dwelling units, um, capped on the plan development. Condition number two, the multifamily development shall be in buildings which do not exceed three stories, nor more than 40 feet in height, and shall maintain a setback distance of at least 90 feet from all external property lines. Number three, the development shall have only have, excuse me, shall have only the two designated shared private driveways onto Georgia Avenue, with the perpetual easements put in place along the drives to facilitate interparcel access and connectivity. The northernmost driveway from Georgia Avenue shall be changed to one-way entry only. Number four, there shall be a perimeter vegetative buffer yard along the development's entire northern, southern, and western boundaries, beginning at a point 100 feet west the Georgia Avenue right-of-way line. The buffer yard shall be at least 10 feet wide and shall include an eight-foot solid opaque fence or wall that is perpetually maintained. The buffer yard shall consist of at least eight trees and 40 shrubs per 100 linear feet. Existing mature trees and other existing vegetation shall be retained where feasible. Any required new planting shall be evergreens. And some commentary on that. Straight for zoning purposes for conventional development, there is no buffer required between R10 and R15 zoning. Which means if the zoning change is approved as requested, those lots facing Georgia Avenue are not required to buffer against lots to their north or to the south. However, there is a buffer yard required by code between RM zoning and R15 zoning. And that requirement is a 20 foot wide buffer yard minimum. Uh, with planting of trees and shrubs. If a developer uh, includes in that buffer yard an opaque fence that is at least six feet high, then the buffer yard width may be reduced by 10 feet. In other words, from 20 feet to 10 feet, but the number of plantings remain the same. So it becomes a little more dense in terms of plantings. What staff is recommending in this condition number four is that the buffer yard extend toward Georgia Avenue by an extra 35 feet refer back to the survey drawing, the proposed R10 area off of Georgia Avenue is 135 feet deep. So staff is recommending that the buffer yard start at 100 feet. And that's to help shield some visibility from Georgia Avenue of the RM portion of the development. And also the trees and shrubs that's recommended here is higher than the minimum required by code in RM and R15. All right, number five, the multifamily parking lot shall include residential scale lighting that is directed downward and away from adjacent properties. Remember, all parking lots, the multifamily on up, that when you have more than 10 parking spaces, is required to be lighted. So in this case, with residential uses, i.e. single family around the perimeter, very important that the lighting be for the interior of the parcel. Number six, Entrance signs for the development shall consist of no more than one monument sign at each entrance. Each be located on private property, not to exceed five feet in height, or 12 square feet in sign copy area. And that's what's being proposed by that. And then lastly, <coughs> number seven, from the date of plan development approval, the development shall commence within two years 
which is a request for permits, and be completed within four years. Otherwise, plan development approval shall automatically expire. And remember from our earlier discussions, um, the zoning change is a conventional um, development standard that goes in place. <coughs> plan development is an overlay approval that is over and above the underlying zone. Even if plan development is approved, an owner of the property is still free to develop the property conventionally according to the zone that's in place. Um, and just a final note and general comment, like I shared with you at the work session, you look at the master plan that's on screen, the applicants have really done a very good job, in my opinion, in coming up with the design for this type of development to fit in with the neighborhood as best possible. Um, the buildings for multifamily are at least 90 feet away from the property lines. They're using heavy buffering, using tasteful architecture, they're consolidating driveways on Fork Avenue, Overall, it reflects good design. Staff's opinion is if this development were somewhere else, another set of conditions of surrounding properties, it would be an excellent proposal. But staff's major objection to both of these requests is the density is far too high for this area, which staff believes is the center of established single family neighborhood. Uh, many other parts of town, I think this would be a very good idea. And therefore, staff is recommending denial of both of these requests. Well, Mr. Moore, that was a bunch of information you just gave us upon her on here. <laughs> uh, Matt, I, I know last week that uh, the uh, commission asked you if you, had, uh, if you had the ability to send us what is the rental market around there. Did, did you able to do that? I checked the applicant's map. I did not check all of them. Um, I had plans to generate a different map for you um, that showed a little broader area, not just the corridors. And if I can get this to move, which is not moving. And while you're doing that, one, one quick question for me before I turn over to the other commissioners is, uh, as, we're present, as if we're presently being asked to deny to do 42 dwellings in this 4.3 acres, uh, but 4.3 acres if requested to be R10, and that, like, I think you said last week that that would generate 19 lots. That's my notes say from last week. Correct. And it's also on the cover page in your report. Um, the mathematics, um, if you do R10 zoning throughout the 4.43 acres, uh, under plan development, they are eligible to ask for 19, at least 19 dwelling units within that acreage. Um, but the 20% bonus density cap allowance that is possible, um, that number rises to, I think, 21 or 23. That would be single-family dwellings? That would be single-family dwellings or some combination of other within reason. Um, with similar requests, we have entertained the prospect of a duplex unit. We look at the total number, the two of the units could be combined together upon good design, um, and by that it sort of mimics the single-family character and single-family appearance, <coughs> um, that becomes possible. But that's a long ways different than a three-story park building. Okay. Um, so in other words, if they were approved for R10 zoning and they wanted to come in with a plan development of one 19-unit apartment building that was three stories tall, to me that contradicts the R10 zone. Um, so the purpose is to maintain the character of the single-family type development. But there's enough flexibility in our plan development process that with good design, you can mix and match this a little bit if there's good justification. One final, or maybe two final questions myself. The timeline that you generated under your conditions, and I, I don't know if this is something that, that you could answer or will ask the applicants, is the timeline of two years of starting something, four years of cap. Is there any, which comes first, the cart or the horse on that? Does the three-story building or does the single-family dwellings? The applicants have indicated they are proposing to develop, develop it all at once, not, uh, not in phases. Um, the two and four year time frames is based on what we have given to prior plan development requests um, in the same keeping of time frame. Um, it's my belief and my impression from the applicants they are wishing to develop this a lot faster than the two and four years. Um, but that gives them a little flexibility of time to get construction documents prepared, submitted, and so forth. But the two years is really just the time frame to get things prepared and submitted. Um, and then after that, they've got two additional years to actually build the development. Commissioners, I would yield to questions for staff. <coughs> I have a couple questions. You, you said, I just want to make sure I hear you right, if the underlying zoning is approved, 
and the DUD is approved, the applicant could disregard the DUD and proceed only in accordance with the underlying zone? Correct. Um, the property, and it's, this is described in the staff reports, it's an unusual condition in terms that it only has 512 feet of frontage and zoned R15, the minimum lot width is 100 feet. So conventionally, you can only divide the property to five lots. Um, if you do the math, each of those five lots would average about 38,000 square feet each, which is a little bit short of one acre, and that is a lot less dense than the surrounding area. And the alternative to that is to construct a public road back into the property, probably with a cul-de-sac, in order to gain additional frontage in which to have additional lots. Um, if you do that, in round numbers, approximately 10 lots could be realized. You're going to lose some of the land to the road. Um, the main issue with that is that the cost of developing such a road, particularly with a cul-de-sac, conventionally, is very, very expensive and in all likelihood very cost prohibitive, it would not happen. However, under plan development, um, with flexibility in design, and that includes the design of the roadway, um, you could create a private driveway path through there that meets the intent of the public standards, in other words, allows emergency vehicles in and out, but you would not have the full expense of a cul-de-sac, perhaps some alternative, perhaps reduced pavement width, perhaps a deep drive at the end, instead of a cul-de-sac, uh, omit sidewalks. A lot of things that are cost-saving measures um, that make the development of the rear portion of the property more feasible. Um, so then it's a matter of the numbers. Under R15 zoning, which is what all of the property is currently zoned, plan development, they are uh, eligible to request up to 12 dwelling units for the entire acreage, or with the 20% bonus density, a possibility of up to 15. And that's with here, uh, uh, so that would be the range that they would have to work in, which is more than the 10 that would be afforded to them convention. My other question may be your opinion, but you said that this was an excellent development. From what I've seen since I've been on here, it does seem to be, but not appropriate for this area. Where, where in your mind would it be appropriate? Um, you have, by just looking at the design from the cloud level. You have a single family road in the front area of an entrance with multi-family behind it. Um, to staff, the main objection is you have single family neighborhood on all four sides. If that were not the case, in other words, if the, as you look at the plan, the west side of the property or the top of the screen, if that was a commercial corridor or additional multi-family development, but because of some reason um, the property had to only gain its access through the single family neighborhood. In this, in terms of design, the entrance area mimics a single family neighborhood, but the land use of multifamily next to something else that's fairly intensive, like multifamily or office or commercial, is not a sharp contrast. So along a busier road, like a, a Bay Tree or a Jerry Jones or something, you have a different land use pattern on one side than you do on the other. Something like this works well. It's a sort of transition between two different <coughs> intensity levels. Um, but in the middle of a single family neighborhood, it's a little bit different. So I guess that, that points to the reason I'm struggling a little bit because, you know, single family, of course, you drive up and you see a single family home like everybody thinks of. But each bedroom is rented out to different people. So practically speaking, it's not a single family. And in this neighborhood, at least if the applicants do believe, there's 40% of it that's not single family that's rental property. So where do when do we when do we undraw those lines? I mean when do we when do we recognize? Right. And we work with of course a set of zoning definitions, single family is one household unit, um, whether it be owner occupied residence or renter occupied residence is still a single family residence. The land use is the same, the occupants may vary, um, and there's all sorts of other variables that come into play. A single family residence that's two retirees, that's a retired couple, would have, of course, a different impact than a family with eight children. But it's still one household, one single family residence. And then over time, you know, household units, we cannot control um, who lives there, whether they own or the renters. The use is what the use is. 
any other questions for staff on the report? I got one more. Mr. Lewis? Matt, is there anywhere in that um, area that there's a multifamily dwelling that you should? In have? this area? Yeah. Um, no. Um, the maps in your packet go to a little broader area, but you see in R15 zoning, it's all the way around. You see the lot pattern that's there. Um, the closest multifamily is going to be on the other side of Oak Street, due east of here. I remember the map when I measured it in GIS, it's like 1,700 feet. So that would be to the Timbers, which is on West Cranford Avenue, just east of Oak Street. That's the closest one as the crow flies. That's measured straight through property, not down the streets. Um, get some R10 zoning, you can go a similar distance southward, you can go across Alton, and get some Cherokee Avenue, get some R10 zoning there. So it's all R15 in between. And then from here to Morcho Road and northward, it's all R15. And westward, it's R15 all the way. Most of those are down. No three story um, there, Unless there's a three story house somewhere that I've not remembered seeing that. Can you draw the distinction for us between the stuff on Cranford and Oak and Dick? I mean, as far as where right. it sits versus well, what's the difference? Correct. On West Cranford, those apartments that were built in recent years are zoned RP. Um, and that's a zoning that was put in place in the 1980s. And a lot of that property sat empty for many years, up until a few years ago. Um, when those came through the public hearing process, and for them, the public hearing was required only because it's in the historic district. It was not a zoning change. Um, there was an awful lot of neighborhood opposition to the use, but the use itself was not a question. It was simply the design um, of the development. But there you had West Cranford between Oak and Patterson. It was not a residential corridor. You had more residential uses toward the West End, but you had medical offices in here toward Patterson. Um, proximity to two busy roads, um, a lot different than this area. And then southward, you get into the other side of Alden Avenue, you get more of an R10 development pattern, the smaller lots, usually smaller homes, and that extends southward down the Bay Street Road. <coughs> you may recall a few years ago, we had a more family request that was between the Alden Park neighborhood and Bay Street. Uh, you had a Bay Street border on one side and uh, on the other, which by example is something this could fit in with. Um, if you had on the, as you see at the top of the screen, which is the west side of the boundary, say a completely built out shopping center or something commercial or other apartments, so there was no practical need to access through there, the busy road, so then coming back off the busy road as you go toward the bottom of the map, you get into the same kind of neighborhood. This would serve as the filling in the gap between those two areas. Okay, at this time we will open this up to the audience. Anybody here this evening wishing to speak in favor of this request, please come forward this time and state your name and your address for the record, please. My name is Joseph Johnson. I'm a 2408. Is Mike Yes, sir. I'll turn it up. Okay. Just give us a second if you don't mind. Good afternoon. Captain Joseph. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm here with John Fortson and Al Howell to talk about Ford and Park and Innovators in Springfield. I'm going to talk to you tonight about a couple of things. First, we're going to tell you about who we are. We're all working to raise about our school. We grew up here. We've committed to raising our family since I'm not going to do this yet. I want to talk to you about a couple things. First, I want to talk to you about 
What made it, what motivated us to choose this property to rebuild? Next, I want to talk to you about the single family home option that establishes us and the townhome single family option that we're proposing. Third, I want to talk to you about the impact this project may have on the neighborhood. Also, I want to discuss density and why we pick 36 now. Then I want to talk to you about how the comprehensive plan, what it says about infield density. All right. So let's talk about what motivated us to do this property to We are sick of seeing people and families that have grown up here by Austin leave the city and go to the county. They're attracted to new homes. They're being built in subdivisions all over. But they work in the city. So they use our roads to move back and forth every day. And if you bridge down and across the road, baby, you know that traffic is a serious issue on that road. So this slide shows you that this is becoming a bigger problem. This is inside of the look at the 60s, the 2014, and they chose Val Gossip was the number one city in the nation for the fastest declining population. We lost more people in 2014, 2015 than all the people. Now these people aren't going to Thomasville or Savannah or Atlanta or Macon. They're going from Val Gossip to the county, to those new homes. They were updated homes with more bathrooms, with newer appliances. And so we need to update our housing stock. All right, we just heard a lot about this is a map of Georgia Avenue. This is a project in Miller, and we just heard a lot about how you know, there's a lot of R15 zoning in this area. If you look at a map of the zoning, that's what it shows. But if you look at the individual lots, there's a mixture of land. There's R6, there's, there's 30, there's more than 30 R6 lots that I'll identify on this map. And if you look at the chart, the frontage is between 49 and 50 feet. Now, 15 zoning requires a hundred, more than 100 feet of, of frontage. And more than a quarter acre. None of those lots that I highlight. Now what makes this a desirable neighborhood to live in? It is proximity to some of the best amenities that you have. Along North Oak Street and Park, you have a sidewalk system that goes to a number of things. <coughs> Multiple parks, Drexel Park, Mackey Park, the tennis courts, Dobson Middle School, the track. You've got a hospital, you've got a college, you've got businesses, you've got churches. And we want to give more people access, walkable access, to those amenities. That's what people, that's the reason people live in the city. This neighborhood is difficult to build single family homes. And I've highlighted some of those reasons. It's got a high percentage of rent. It's got a low average cost per square foot, $72. That's not including foreclosures. That is fair market value. Arms length transaction. There's been several foreclosures, and I want to point out one in particular. Right across the street from this park, 605 Georgia Avenue, two weeks ago, it sold for $29,000. $29,000! Those factors show you that this neighborhood is going through a stressful period. And it may not revert. I mean, it may continue down this path if we don't become proactive about doing something. <coughs> also, I want to point out that you know, you've know got multi-family zone. We just talked about this. This is the Timbers. It's surrounded on all four sides by single-family homes. And that's the best thing that could ever happen. I mean, the developer that built this project then went next door and redeveloped those old one-bedroom single or multi-family housing that has that look off. And if you ride down that street, you will see what an improvement he has done along that neighborhood. All right, there are only really two options for developing this land. We can do single family. Or we can do a combination of single family and town. Now, these are the infield guidelines for the city of Valdosta. And they show that if you're going to do single, single family, they want you to do high quality single family homes. I mean, look at these structures. They're elevated so that you have a prominent entrance to the front porch. They want, they want, they want porches. They want gables. They want transit windows. They want dormers. If this is not what you're seeing built in the county right now, they want garages behind the unit so the homes are made the focal point of the street. 
It needs the old homes that we saw many years ago. And that's what we want to bring back to this neighborhood. <coughs> so this is the 19 single family homes that we're going to build now. Right? We can build 19 single family homes there. But look at this plan. There's no demand for this house. All you're doing is cramming a bunch of rooftops and pavements on these 4.4 acres. So the people that live here, they have nowhere to go. I mean, they have a house, a nice house, but they have to spend all of their time inside. What this plan shows you in red are the setback lines using R6, not R10 or R15, R6. And you can see everything in yellow is outside the setback. Those garages and car doors, I only put them 10 feet off the single family. The requirement's 15 feet. So, <coughs> one house out of 19 homes gets a car door along George Avenue. One on. And everybody else. They're going to put their homes in front of the house so that they have The focus will be on the vehicles and not the homes. I mean, this is what you saw in Blue This is a rotten actor. It may look good when you first did it, but in five years, this thing is going to be rotten at its core. If you look at the price that we projected to build these single family homes, you can see that the cost is $106. That's 50% more than the $72 per square foot of fair market value of 170 neighborhood. That's 50%. That makes it a huge risk to even a 10th single family. The cost of the land and the construction and the material for its quality home is difficult to do for anything else. Just give me a tiny copy. Would you mind speaking a little more to the microphone for everyone to give you such a little? Thank you. So this is the townhome regulations. It's also recommended for the building. It shows parking behind the house. They won't scale the scale of the building. They want it no longer than 200 feet and no taller than 35 feet. So we keep using the word three story. But these townhomes are 35 feet tall. That's the same height that is required by R15. So we're building no higher than the current R15 zone would allow. All right, we know it's a struggle to propose town homes and establish single family neighborhoods. But we're not the first person that's implemented this strategy. If you look here, this is what we're doing by the They're built in New York Valley. Everything it brings an R15 lot, and it exits off the Sherwood Drive, which is substantially less traffic than New York Valley. If this development had a major impact on those lots, no one would have approved Bay Tree Condominium. And that's not the first example. There's four more up here, right? You've got West Air, that's my neighborhood. I live in West Air. And the man that built that community built West Air Condominium right in there, much long after he built the neighborhood. The Timbers Condominium, we just talked about that one frame for that. Area. The Gardens Apartments are building on Country Club, and they back up the Bell Meadows Subdivision, where the price per square foot is, is pretty high, a lot higher than Georgia Avenue. The links of apartments were built many years ago. If you ride through there today, they still look great. So we understand that the development, we understand the impact that may happen with town and establishments. And that's why we have done a lot of planning to get these town homes pushed towards the center of the property, around the central green space, so the people that live there have somewhere to go. It brings people out of their homes and gives them a place to cook out or to walk their dog or socialize with people that live around them. We've also spent a lot of time you know, thinking about how to preserve all the existing trees in the property. That's probably one of the biggest features of it. Those homes are so big around, me and you couldn't put an arms around. So by using and conserving that natural stream and also by planting more trees that fill in any gaps along that buffer. We can make sure that those single family homes along Georgia Avenue remain the focal point of the street. The drawing beneath the, uh, the top shows what it would look like if you were standing on Georgia Avenue looking back towards the town home. And you can see the single family homes are tall enough. Those single family homes are 28 to 30 feet tall. And if you're standing on Georgia Avenue or across the street from Georgia Avenue, 
You're not going to be able to see the panel through the single panel structure. Alright, so we talked a lot about density, right? But density is not an accurate representation of population. You can have four bedroom units in R6 at 7.2 units per acre and achieve 124 bedrooms. We're not trying to maximize density here. If we were, we'd be proposing four bedroom units, or we'd be stacking them up along Board Avenue, but we don't want to do that. The reason that we're proposing 36 townhomes is a supported debt service on six single-family homes. But we're taking a $1.2 million risk on six single-family homes. 50% more, we're asking a sales price of 50% more than the average cost per square foot of the existing homes. That's a humongous risk, humongous. So getting 36 townhomes reduces that risk of 15% of the net operating income. If we go down to 18, that's 30 percent. We can't do that. We can't spend 30 percent of the operating income on the debt service for single family homes. So you can see we're proposing 107 bedrooms, which is substantially less than the R6 zoning program that would be allowed in our zone. All right. By getting these lots, Developing, developing them as one parcel. We can have a much more logical and orderly development. But if you don't think that this is a good idea, we'd be happy to sell it to somebody else. But we're not doing a low quality project. I'm not, I'm not interested. In but there are other people out there who are. And so what you're in up with, you know, it's anything to get to. But what you're going to do is end up harming the street stage along the board And that's the one thing that we have to do. Now, the comprehensive plan talks about a variety of things. It says that they want to promote innovative design to encourage a mixture of housing types and varying income levels. It also says that they want to promote density by encouraging more compact urban development. It also wants to encourage, it also says that available land shall be utilized in the most efficient manner possible are promoting infill development. Now we need you to continue investing in older communities like George Avenue by providing a mixture of housing styles and prices so that neighborhoods remain healthy and accessible to the next generation of residents. If you decide to support this project tonight, it will send a powerful signal to local home builders and Valdosta supports innovative infill development and established residential neighborhoods. And that's what we need. Let's stand in just for a second. Commissioners, any questions for the presenter this evening? I've got one. Go ahead. Uh, uh, on uh, the back side of your uh, development, uh, which backs up to a uh, drive, uh, those are single family dwellings, right? It's along Isaiah? Yes, they are. Uh, so it will, you're going to have your buffer of the single family in front that you're going to propose and build. But in the back, you're going to have your two story that's going or three stories going back up to them. You're right. That's right. How's, how's that going to affect uh, their existing lives? So you'll see this. We're 90 feet off that property line. There's also some information in the packet where we're taking pictures of the tree line and it's substantial. I mean, those trees are more than 100 feet tall. They have huge canyons. If you look at those pictures in your packet, you cannot even see the single family homes on the other side. That's how big it is. And that's what we want to preserve. We're going to spend a lot of time preserving all of that existing tree line around the perimeter of the property so that you will not see these families. Another question, guys? Because I, I appreciate your presentation. You've, you've done a really, really nice job with your presentation. I, I will echo some of your sentiments that you started off early on about the uh, the exodus of the senior residents to the counties. I know it's been an issue. We discussed it 
numerous times about, about exit, so I do, do appreciate your bringing that to light and trying to curb that. Uh, again, your presentation was very excellent done. Uh, I know your last thing that you, that you mentioned about the infield, about uh, bringing people back into the city, I, I do know that in some of the larger cities that within a 100 mile radius of us are very much encouraging it among the builders to go and buy a property locally and to rejuvenate neighborhoods. So I do appreciate that comment from you also. And another question, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. You were talking about people leaving the city for the county. Uh, well, these uh, apartments there, do you think the people are going to be moving from there instead of going to the county? So we are looking at several examples of where multi-family and single-family is coming in. It's worked well. If we did have a major impact and some of these are moving to all, I don't think you would see more of the building less than a couple hundred feet. But here you're only presenting six homes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't want anybody to move from an existing home. I'm sorry? That, uh, somebody might not want to move from the existing home into the apartments, but and you're only giving them six homes to move into, so it's it's not gonna not gonna stem that flow from the city to the county. Well, I think what we're doing is we're, we're creating updated homes with more than one. Some of the homes in this neighborhood were built with three bedrooms and one bath, and so what my generation is facing is you know, if you buy an older home and then take the savings that you acquire over a number of years and use it to renovate that house? Or do you just go out into the town and buy a brand new home and get the bank from it? I understand where you're coming from, but uh, I can't see where six homes is going to make that much of a difference. Well, it's going to preserve the street safe a lot that, Yeah, I agree with that. And then, you know, the legal laws also are not typically That's what kind of changed over the last few years. We have a lot of people, a lot of single women who have great jobs, and they don't want a house that they can take care of, that can mow the lawn, that can pay the maintenance. They want something that's much less small. So I think what you're going to see is the professionals and the people that are temporarily working in that process, most of the rest of the time, not college, not just thinking, having the next
So we're going to have to keep the cost and the sales price pretty close together. So we're not looking, that's what I'm saying. This is not a profit motive that we're using to build single family homes. We're doing that because we're great neighbors, because we want to preserve the world's life. But in return, we're asking for a little higher debt service. That's what we're going to use to support the debt service of the home sales. And that's the strategy. I mean, that is the strategy. It's not to make money off the single family homes, to make money off the condos, to just throw money around. But we are going to have opportunity <coughs> selling these homes much more than the average cost of it. One more question, I promise you. The, 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 six, the six homes are going to pay the sale, okay, that, that we've talked about tonight. The six homes. George, George Avenue, I'm sorry. The six homes are going to pay is George Avenue. Are those going to be 100% sale option or would those ever be in a rental portfolio? No, we're, we're not trying to rent That's what we're saying. We're going to use the debt service. We're going to start the debt service with the rental income from the apartment and keep them vacant until they sell. If we fill all the rentals, it's going to make it even tougher on the sale to sell. Thank you, Judge. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, and Go ahead, sir. I'm just curious, and, and I know we've run over my 15-minute timeline. I appreciate everybody's patience. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in favor of this request? Please come forward. If you would, sir, please state your name and your address for the record, please. Hey, my name is Anthony Woods. I live at 303 North Avenue, South of Bronson. I have been connected to this matter with my son, John, is one of the um, I agree that they judge have said. Um, I, I've been in the real business for 20 years, and kind of up here about minutes ago. It is hard to rent houses. We got off now. <coughs> yesterday, Saturday, yesterday, I drove from Georgia, from uh, North to Oak, Oak to Bay Tree, Bay Tree to Avenue, Avenue to Barnco, Barnco to uh, Ash, and back to uh, Ash. I said, I think. It's Actually, I counted 171 for a man for sale in that area. 171. And that goes back to what those said a few minutes ago. And people leaving the city to go to the county. It's because they're leaving the older houses to go to the newer houses. And if you go out Dalgo Road where 1,500 houses have been built out there in the last year, you better buy out there for your house. The new people, the young people are fine. You know, the small houses with no yards, that's what people want. Energy efficient, and, and it's not. It's, I don't know if anybody's noticed the uh, light that we have in our city. Uh, I'm sure you don't know. Uh, because Mark talked about 40% rental market. That's probably true. And what I would say is that uh, real estate conforms. The more empty houses we have in our neighborhood, and I'm in the neighborhood, the lower our value is going to be in our house. So we're attacking the wrong problem. Instead of thinking, instead of going to get an investment, we need to attack the non-rented, non-owned, non-occupied uh, houses. What better way to do that except to pump some new blood into it, new life into it? This is good. Here's the contract too. We have a little son who took the job in Warner Robins in, in um, August. He moved to Warner Robins. Took him two weeks to find an apartment. I'll be going to Warner Robins like that. Day. You can't even find a place in Warner Robins. Going so fast. Look, ninety-six, new growth everywhere. It's not that deep. Um, I've been in real business. My plan changed four years ago. My family and I, we didn't have we own thirty-three properties in Lincoln Valley. Uh, eight of them now are currently unoccupied. And we've got rid of that. And I have been renting some houses on Oak Street. That's my plan. That's the only way you get people to rent houses anymore. And Doug said something about the temperance a few minutes ago. I went to those meetings and people were really upset about the temperance. It's like this to say, they're beautiful now. I mean, they're a lot better off of them. So this is improvement, not deterioration. And it's kind of like the, the risk of the Wyndham Garden Hotel downtown. And the, the idea of that is to have an investment, spur, spur investment, spur growth. That's what this is. And I'm going to say one more thing, that is uh, people think. Not in my backyard. And we've heard that much before. Poor business. And then one more thing I can say is, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's 
Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, people fear. It's the right vision. I hope you approve it. Mr. Coulson, right there. Commissioners, any questions for the presenter? Mr. Coulson, appreciate you coming forward. Okay. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this request? That's what we're going to run over. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of this request, please come forward at this time. There being none, anyone here wishing to speak in denial of this request, <laughs> please come forward. These young ladies are stood up. I will receive you first, ma'am, if you will. State your name and your address for the public record, please, ma'am. My name is Pamela Rickman. My husband and I are Pamela Rickman. 26 year residents of Valdosta, 17 years in our present home at 501 Georgia Avenue, which is one block south of the proposed redevelopment. We thank you, commissioners, for the time this evening. I'd like to thank the developer, the applicant, for the considerable time that he put into proposing an attractive piece of property. Thank Ms. Gladwin for making the professional choice to recuse herself, given her circumstances. And we thank Mr. Martin for his thorough research and consideration of all aspects of the proposal, which we heard at the work session last Monday. Mr. Martin, who has considerable information sources at his disposal, and who's professionally trained in this area, has recommended denial of rezoning and the proposal. We concur with this for three main reasons. Character of the neighborhood, infrastructure, and safety. The applicant's project we see as a spot zoning change. As Mr. Martin pointed out correctly again this evening in his summary, there is a significant difference between R15 and RM. It is not an incremental change. It destroys the cohesiveness of the single-family neighborhood, a neighborhood that is 70% owner-occupied in the immediate neighborhood, including many long-term residents and original families, but also in recent years, including several new owner-occupants who have built or renovated high-value homes within this single-family neighborhood. To rezone this as RM, sets a precedent that could allow for future developments that maximize the density to the stated, I believe it was 18 units um, per, and that would further increase development that is not to scale for the R15 neighborhood. Rental thereby becomes the default instead of the norm and encourages transient population. It is true that there are single-family homes within this R15 neighborhood that are presently rental. But to rezone it as multifamily discourages <coughs> owner-occupancy of the remaining single-family. And some of those single-family homes have come back into owner-occupant usage. For example, in canvassing the neighborhood, I met a family from the Air Force, recently returned from Korea, who had lived previously in Valdosta and who, anticipating their return, purchased a home on Georgia Avenue. They were horrified to hear from me just two weeks following their move into this chosen purchased property that this proposal was before the commission. There is no need for more rental units, not even nearby VSU students, as Mr. Corson Sr. pointed out, there are many empty rentals now available. We are also concerned about the infrastructure burden um, engendered by this proposed development and rezoning. Waste and water are already a problem in this neighborhood with outdated pipes, frequent re repairs. Uh, the information I collected from the city shows 50 repairs in the previous 30 months in a four-block area, including George Avenue. Stormwater problems are definitely something we already experience in this neighborhood. The addition of sidewalks, roof lines, and paved parking for 102 vehicles would only exacerbate this problem. 
this on screen is the property right in front. This is the street right in front of the property. I drive this street every day. It looks like this every time it rains. Uh, the residents of Georgia, Cranford, and Alden have already experienced a significant increase in flooding since the recent building of multifamily units on Cranford Avenue. They're beginning to know how Noah felt. <laughs> it is true that stormwater storage is proposed on site by the developer, and it undoubtedly meets code, but code is not necessarily reality. Also, the road infrastructure is already burdened by the stormwater and the traffic in the immediate neighborhood. At the work session last week, Mr. Martin spoke about the fact that this Georgia Avenue was built to accommodate greater volume of traffic than it presently has. Um, but that was way back then, and driving is different now as those of us who live in the neighborhood can attest. Speeds are different. The canopy has changed, including the growth of the historic oak on Georgia Avenue, just right down the block from the proposal. Young drivers, of whom there are likely to be many more with multifamily so close to the university. This would be of concern for the infrastructure. But we also are concerned about safety. The accident rate is relatively high, uh, as the map shows. Um, those of us who live there have experienced greater traffic. I hear it. I hear screech, slam, and sirens on that bottom intersection that you see there, which is just a block from my house. Uh, Twelve accidents reported in the last two years. I also go to the other stop sign at the other end every day and turn left into that school zone where nine accidents have been reported in the last two years. And that's reported that doesn't count the sign at the end with a double arrow that is regularly plowed down, undoubtedly unnoticed in the middle of the night. And we regularly have um, headlights and pieces of bumpers sitting in our yard because we sit across from an intersection. We're also concerned about the residents themselves in this proposed multifamily development. The security and the safety of those back of the lot apartments. They are not easily seen from the road. Patrolling would require extra police time. Ordinance compliance would be harder to monitor. And we are concerned because of our experiences in the neighborhood that guest parking may interfere not only with traffic but with emergency vehicle access to this multifamily residential property at the back of the unit. <clears throat> this proposed multifamily development does not meet the initial, <coughs> the number one goals, as stated in the comprehensive plan. It does not increase home ownership or attract and retain young professionals, except for, of course, perhaps the six houses on the front. And it does not protect existing housing. We ask you to please vote no on this rezoning proposal and development in order to avoid the unnecessary burdens on the infrastructure, public safety, and taxpayers that could easily result as the infrastructure and safety are dealt with, um, and to protect the character and value of this stable, single-family, owner-occupied neighborhood. I thank all of my neighbors and other supporters who have helped in putting together this presentation and most especially have gotten the word out. Many of them are here tonight. I'd like to ask if those who are here in opposition to the proposed rezoning and development would please stand, or if you're already standing, as many of you are, raise your hand. We can't. Okay. And and as you count, I'd also like to add that we have one other person present. Um, Dr. Raymond Cook is here by cell phone because he could not make it tonight and sent 
his aide to my door to ask me to call so that he could listen to the proceedings on the phone. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions for the As I said earlier, I'm sort of struggling with this because it's a, it's a really good proposal, but I understand uh, homeowner concerns. And, and I wonder if you could give me your opinion on where you think this neighborhood will be in 15 years. That's an excellent question. I have lived, as I said, in the neighborhood for 26 years when my husband and I felt a little bit tight as our family grew, we moved three blocks to stay in the neighborhood. Um, we have seen an increase in rentals, but we have also seen in that time young professionals move back into the neighborhood and renovate and upgrade and add nice new bathrooms and redo kitchens in and add landscaping to the neighborhood. Um, our immediate south neighboring property uh, has changed hands six times in the 18 years my husband and I have been in our home. Every one of those has been an owner. Every one of them has been a professional and they have only moved because of job transfers or their own growing families. So, um, I see that the impact of the university is such that the, the housing is going up and down. Um, we have seen the university expand and now shrink again. We have seen changes in the composition of the neighborhood that has then changed back over the 26 years that we have been living in the neighborhood. I would not want to see the neighborhood in 15 years or 20 years look the way I have seen many RM properties in town look over the course of 15 years, which look beautiful when they are built and 15 years later don't. So I guess my, here's my real where I'm kind of struggling. So I think you know, in my mind, the best thing that could happen for every homeowner in this room is if, is if, if Joseph is to be believed in that the average price per square foot is $72 a foot. And when you get ready to sell your home, or your children get ready to sell your home after you're gone, but they can sell your home for $20 more a square foot than it currently is. And I'm struggling with how exactly to get there, whether it's no, folks no, coming no. in and buying no, no. Your home, whether it's folks coming in and buying your home and renovating it or whether it's some kind of mixture of development like this I, I I don't know I don't have the right answer but I think you and I would both agree that's where you want to get to you want to be able to sell your home for more than what the current fair market value is I, mean, I could sell my home today for considerably more than what I purchased it for 18 years ago I, I'm sure you could I mean, I, but, but but can you sell it for a hundred dollars a square foot like you can a, a new home I honestly can say that I have not investigated that option because I do not wish to leave the neighborhood nor my home. But you will one day. Or my children will have to sell it <laughs> after they carry me out in the pine box. Thank you. I, I, will, I will piggyback off of Christopher Fulton's question and just ask you, so the, the six properties that face uh, Georgia has proposed. Would you agree that the only thing they will do is enhance your property values? I believe that the six family, single family homes that have been proposed by the applicant are very attractive properties. I am cognizant of the fact that the lots are tremendously larger than some other places. I don't think they're tremendously larger than other lots within the neighborhood. So I'll take this as a yes, it's going to improve your property value? I don't think six single family homes alone 
will have a significantly negative impact on my property value, but I haven't investigated it. Because I'm not getting ready to sell my home and I'm not expecting to go out in the pine box anytime soon. Please, God. I hope you are. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, we, we have about 14 minutes left on denial. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor, come forward this time. And I'll pick it up. Opposition. 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 Yeah. Burbage. <laughs> what did I say? I'm Sahi Perez. I live at 707 Georgia Avenue. I've been living there for 27 years. I like it enough to buy two adjacent houses for mine, so I have a free lot on Georgia Avenue. I appreciate the developers to come to the area. But I don't think the current plan will help the area at all. I will support them revising the plan by having six houses placed in Georgia Avenue and six houses in the back. That will not change the current character of the area. I remember 10 or 15 years ago, another proposal came to rezoning on Georgia Avenue and near Alton. And that proposal denied. On Georgia Avenue, there are two lots. If you approve this proposal, there are two potential areas on Georgia Avenue will be candidate for similar rezoning. There is one at the end of Georgia Avenue and Toronto mm -hmm. at the corner, yeah. and there about 10 or 15 years ago, there is one near Alden and Georgia Avenue, not at the corner, just before the corner and was now. I think I appreciate your consideration, and I hope you don't approve the current proposal, revise it to 12 houses on the, on the three lots, and Georgia Avenue is a great area. And if you modify the character of Georgia Avenue, it's going to go to the surrounding neighborhood and damage the whole area. And I don't believe you need that. Any questions for Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else wish to <coughs> We have 10 minutes on this side. Yes, sir. State your name and the address for the record, please. Sir. <coughs> John Miller McIntyre, 600 Georgia Avenue directly across the street from the proposed zoning center. Now my uncle, who owns that property, has lived there for over 50 years. He'd be here tonight if he didn't have an infection and being in the rehab out of the hospital. As far as the, <clears throat> the, the six homes, if that's all it was, yes, it would help increase the value. It's the apartment. That is the issue. I don't care where you look 20 years down the road when you have 36 apartment buildings, it decreases property value. Another big concern would be those two entities coming off of Georgia Avenue. I don't care what anybody said. I live on the corner of Park in Georgia. I see an awful lot of traffic. And it was just going to increase it with the apartments, it's going to bring in a more youthful group. That traffic is going to not just stop, and it doesn't stop at midnight as it is. It is going to increase that. And all of my adjacent neighbors are in their 80s and 90s. That increased traffic is not good. And as far as sidewalks, you got to go up by Oak, which is quite a distance away. And from the back side of this proposal, has to be at least two, if not three miles. So it wouldn't be convenient for people walking up and down Park or George Avenue. There's a few that do walk their dogs and, and walk their babies in that neighborhood. A few. I don't know that increased walking traffic is something I want. 
My family has no intention of getting rid of that property. Or my children. It's about keeping things as they are. It's a nice, great neighborhood. We don't want anything to change. That's all I have. Any questions for Representative? I'm just curious, do your children live locally? No, my children are in college. They're all away. And no, not here. Okay, thank you, sir. We have a brief four minutes left on this side. If somebody would like to come forward for four minutes, please come forward. State your name and your address for the record. My name is Sandra Petitrak. I own a house on 702 Maplewood. My father owns a house on 2211 Azalea Drive, and we own the adjacent one at 2209 Azalea Drive. I have two daughters who would love to come back and live in those houses. I bought that house so that when they finish their college, they can move into it. That's where they want to live. That's where they want to grow up. My daughter's 24 years old. She goes to Kennesaw State University. She graduates in two years. She wants to come home. I told her about these apartments. She goes, oh, I don't want to come home. She's 24 years old. He was talking about statistics. People moving out. People moving in. Where did he get these? I wish I had come prepared. I worked for the university. We had 13,000 students when I started. We're down to 11. Valdosta isn't a booming city. You talk to these students. There's nothing for them to do. They don't want to come here. They don't want to rent these places. You want a family to live here. My daughters want to live here. They want to move back. <coughs> if, if this apartment complex comes in, shoot, I could sell those great houses and move into a stone creek. Why not? County has better schools. Instead, that's one of the main reasons you ask people why they do that. Ask them. I've got tons of Facebook cards. I own a business. Ask them. They go, I want to go to Lance High. So we're moving out of the county. I grew up in the house. I lived at, um, on James Street. Okay? Great neighborhood. I wanted to move back there, you know, when I grew up. The city bought it out because of the overpass.
with an apartment complex in their backyard. You might have six homes there, but you drive by those in 10 years and tell me what they look like. My home has hardwood floors from the 1940s. It has solid wood doors. It had the original heating unit in it until a year ago when I replaced it, from 1949. They don't build houses like that anymore. You might be able to put something up. I, I drive, I've driven past my house in Foxborough, and it was the new home construction. It, it looks horrible. That neighborhood looks horrible. And so that's what you're going to do here. We have, you know, the floors <coughs> are in their 80s. They called me a couple of years ago at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and told me to get in the hallway because there was a tornado coming. You know, we watch out for each other. We see people walking, we wave to each other. That goes away. And, you know, there aren't people that, the, you talk about building houses so people stop going to the county. That's not what you do, you have jobs. The houses aren't gonna bring the people. And I don't know what young professional family is gonna wanna live with an apartment complex in their backyard. Again, my thoughts are totally scattered. I wasn't um, really planning on this. But you should really look into the history on that street. You have the Girardins, you have the McClure's, you have Morris Smith that lived on that house, down that street. The Newburns have strong family ties to it. Um, you know, Jack Newburn told me about there used to be apparently a monkey that the Girardins had at one point in their garage in my yard. Um, you know, I know the old stories of, of Apple and William and that's that that there, that there, and it's not going to be replaced by an apartment complex. And that's basically what you're doing, is building an apartment complex with a couple of tiny houses in the front yard. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, we have heard those speaking in favor of, those speaking in opposition to. Do we need to have any discussion on this request before I ask for a motion? <coughs> As a reminder, Mr. Chairman, we need two motions. Right. You want to do them simultaneously or you want to do seven? You have to resign first. Okay. So that being said, Commissioners, I will take a motion on item number seven this evening to rezone from currently R15 single family R10 and multi family R Mr. Chairman, Mr. Willis, um, I've got uh, several concerns about the rezoning. Uh, I agree with Matt that this is a very, very nice project. Um, I think it would fit other areas in the county or, or city, <coughs> potentially a lot better than here. We have a lot of families that's uh, lived here all their life and wants to continue living in that area. Uh, the concern I heard a while ago about there's a lot of rental and houses vacant in the city in that area. Um, that may be true, but what's going to happen if we approve this and we do have folks that moves into these new facilities, it's only going to possibly enhance the problem that's existing there. But that, that's not the main issue. The main issue is that I personally think that uh, this project is out of character for the area and it would be a set, it would be setting a precedence for the future. And I make a motion that we recommend an hour. Hey, Ms. Comello, I have a motion from Commissioner Willis to for denial. I have a second, I mean a, a, a motion, I have a second from Commissioner Ray. For that. So we rise with uh, with the motion set forth of denial. Do we need any further discussion on that before I ask for a vote? Any, any more discussion on that? There being none, all those in favor of the request stated by Commissioner Willis, if you're in favor of that, please state by the raising your right hand. All opposed to the, Ms. Carmel, that is 6 1 in favor of. Yes, 611, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Matt, with that being stated, do we need to go any further with number eight? Yes, sir. Okay, guys, on, on line out of number eight tonight, which is the request for plan development of 4.3 acres uh, for multi residential development in an R10 RM zoning district, do I have a motion for that? 
Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to uh, echo what uh, Mr. Willis said. You know, this, this really is an excellent plan. But it does appear, based on the public outcry that we see today and all the concern in this room, that uh, this is the right place, the right time in this plan. Uh, I agree with the thinking. I think um, Mr. Johnson did an excellent job in his research and uh, was willing to take a big risk here to take care of what really is a blight in the area. These three lots look terrible on North Avenue. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody can deny it, but uh, based on the concern in this room tonight and the fact that staff has found this inconsistent with the existing neighborhood in several areas, um, I think we uh, I think we should have moved it up. So this is the Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Wiles. I second from Commissioner Willis. Any, any further discussion on the motion for this? There being none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All opposed to that? Ms. Cormell, that is 611 again. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. Appreciate each one of you coming out tonight. And we will take a moment. <laughs>